Before I begin, I should mention that this is an experience report, so I won't be telling you about new research results. I'll be talking about how, to, how I've applied the research results people here have contributed and used it in, um, in a, a real project. So um, let me say a little bit about what I mean by do it yourself. So this is an actual movement, um, and the idea is that uh, it encourages people to construct things themselves in a very practical sense. So, uh, the idea is used easily to obtain materials that are inexpensive without relying on experts uh, to help you. And um, this kind of movement is actually alive and well in Portland, Oregon, where Galawan and is located where I live. And um, so it's kind of a counterculture uh, city has a reputation for that. And it's had a bit of a resurgence, this movement. So just to give you a couple of examples, uh, there's things like the website Etsy, which is very popular in the United States, connects tens of thousands of artists and crafts uh, people uh, with potential buyers by providing micro um, storefronts. Um, Wired Magazine, they had a whole um, article on the maker movement. This is Lemur Freed, who's a major player in the open hardware uh, movement. Um, these days, for just a, a few hundred dollars, you can put together a fully autonomous air vehicle. Uh, Gal actually uses these for research, as well as a number of universities and hobbyists, and still on uh, open hardware and open software, so you can modify it and, and, um, and, and make changes. And uh, our latest toy, Gal, actually, is something John Montreux, our CEO, um, uh, encouraged us to get. And this is a three-dimensional printer, so for about the cost of a uh, high-end laptop, you can uh, print three-dimensional objects, so each object, you know, is less than a fraction of a, just a few cents maybe to print. And you can prototype incredibly complex three-dimensional objects. And what I want to do then is try to convince you that uh, high assurance compiler development is actually part of this movement or should be part of this movement. So how am I going to convince you of that? Well, I think there's uh, three not-so-secret weapons that uh, this community contributes that make this possible. So the idea of using embedded domain-specific languages, we've seen examples of this yesterday already. Um, the idea of building a verifying rather than a verified compiler. So, what I mean by a verifying compiler is a compiler that, for each um, specific compilation of a program, gives you some evidence that that compilation was correct. And this is opposed to a verified compiler, like um, typified by the CompCert project, where I show you once and for all that the compiler was correct. And of course, with a verifying compiler approach, sometimes it's, it can be easier to produce evidence because it's specialized for a specific program. And then finally, um, in a very practical sense, building on the open source tools and uh, technologies that have been built, so things like in testing with QuickCheck, uh, open uh, source uh, verification tools and fronts for things like SMT solvers and decision procedures. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about that more in a few minutes, but first I just wanna give you some details about the specific project that we worked on and just give you a little bit of background about that. So uh, I'm gonna have a pop quiz here. This is the only pop quiz in the talk. Um, does anyone know what the first A in NASA stands for? Just yell it out. Yes. Okay, great. That's wonderful. So yes, and don't feel bad if you didn't know. So many people think about NASA's being um, the United States space program and uh, in terms of uh, funding by an order of magnitude or so, it really is. But they also do fundamental research in, in making uh, aircrafts, uh, aircraft uh, safer and more efficient. And in particular, they do work in software assurance for flight critical systems. So they've been a, a funder for many decades and a proponent of using formal verification. But um, the work that we did with NASA the idea was to take a different approach. So the idea here was to borrow from the runtime verification community to try to um, bring some um, ver uh, assurance to software systems at runtime. So the runtime verification community kind of marries uh, formal verification with testing. So the idea is I have a legacy software system, it's probably a very complex system, and I uh, want to uh, uh, instrument it with some uh, properties so that, so that I can check at runtime or maybe during testing. And so they use aspect-oriented uh, kinds of approaches to efficiently uh, compile these properties and instrument the program with it. 
So um, uh, for this project, uh, uh, Gala's response to, to um, NASA's need here was to develop a embedded domain-specific language that we call Copilot. So this is um, a language and uh, compiler, and the idea was to generate, um, to synthesize properties for use in runtime monitoring in an embedded environment. So we were looking at distributed, fault-tolerant, real-time embedded systems with, where we have both hardware and software. So the language itself is um, a stream-based language, you know, not unlike, say, Loose, for folks who are familiar with that, and it generates um, a fairly small uh, subset of C code. And in particular, the C that's generated is constant time and constant memory, so we don't have um, a dynamic memory allocation. And with the constant time, it, this helps us do, say, worst case execution time analysis, which is very important because we don't want the timing of the, 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 uh, the monitors to disrupt some real time system. Also, uh, we generate our own scheduler, so we don't need necessarily to run on top of an RTOS to do scheduling, which allows us to run on a fairly impoverished uh, uh, hardware. So um, I think this is the only code in the talk, and I just wanted to give you just kind of a taste of what the expression language of Copilot looks like. So here's um, a Haskell program that generates Fibonacci sequence. Here's the corresponding Copilot program. Um, we wrote this to try, uh, we made the surface syntax um, be fairly familiar for folks who are already Haskell programmers, and so it should feel just like programming with lists. The only exception is because we're always dealing with streams, we automatically would lift operators, um, pointwise operators, to the stream level. So, for example, we don't need to use zip lists or maps um, to, to, uh, to lift uh, these operators. Um, due to time constraints, I won't uh, go into details about other uh, constructs in language, but we have the ability, of course, to sample it's the external world. So think of this as uh, what's available at, at, uh, at the C level, so sampling external C variables, calling C functions and using their return values, arrays, and so on and so forth. And of course, there's a notion of output, so triggers, so telling you when a property has been violated or not. Okay, so the architecture is what you might expect for an embedded domain specific language. We've got a number of libraries built on top of the of the specification language. So these are to help you write your specifications. So things like bounded LTL, pastime LTL, regular expression, so on and so forth. Uh, from the, from the uh, uh, front end, we do a little bit of uh, domain specific type checking, get a, uh, a explicit core representation for which we have an interpreter and a few backends. And in fact, the backends are actually also embedded domain specific languages themselves, also in Haskell. So we use Tom Hawkins' Atom language, which is a C code generator as well as Logan Aircock's SVB um, package, which uh, allows it's a front-end for SMT solving, as well as has the C code uh, generated. Okay, so um, in this project, uh, we had the challenge of um, the question of who monitors the monitor. Um, and here's one answer, but uh, I think taken in some airport. Uh, but the, the, seriously, the idea was if this runtime verification system is your last line of defense, we don't want bugs in the compiler and the copilot to give us false positives or false negatives, right? So we need some, we want some assurance here. And um, there's a tension because EDSLs, of course, are great. We all know that they're great for prototyping new cha changes to a language, rapidly um, um, uh, adding or subtracting various constructs. But this can um, mean that you might uh, accidentally introduce bugs, say, you know, it changes one backend, not another, or the interpreter starts disagreeing. Um, in addition, um, uh, everyone wants assurance, but uh, no one wants to pay for it, and um, uh, particularly in, in the industrial world. So, uh, you know, we didn't have time on this project to do, you know, say, actually prove properties about the compiler. Um, the goal was to get it done, and do some experiments with some hardware with NASA and, 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 and fly with them. So the, the question then was, how can we sneak in some assurance here? And um, in retrospect, the four lessons we learned are fairly obvious, um, and they'll be obvious to folks in this room, but um, I think um, it was, uh, this was a nice experience in terms of uh, uh, learning how to try to sneak in some pretty good assurance in an EDSL for uh, the correctness of, of so I want to talk about uh, four things in the remaining 10 minutes or so. The idea of turning incomplete DSLs, but turning incomplete macros, multi-level type checking, cheat testing and proofs, and having a unified host language. Okay, 
So lesson number one. So um, with a DSL, uh, one of the harder things is actually what to keep out of it rather than what to put in it, right? And, um, and oftentimes, uh, um, if you can keep out, if you can keep out uh, like general programming, then your job can get a lot easier. So things like compiler writing is simplified. You can actually do compiler analyses that you can't normally do. So do things like uh, termination analysis, automatically generate measures. And um, although this is a safety critical project, we do a lot of work in security at Galo. And so there's an interesting point about uh, security. So uh, Lynn Sussman and some of his co-authors had a nice paper arguing that one of the principal reasons we have so much networking security today is that uh, data interchange languages um, and, and say uh, things like SQ, uh, SQL queries are, are, are too powerful. So like in ASN.1, for example, is a turn complete language. And so you can uh, maliciously encode arbitrary computation there, and there's no real good reason for this. Uh, and finally, you know, if we have simple programs, so we don't have heat manipulations, we don't have general recursion, um, things like automated verification, SMT solving, model checking has a chance of working out of the box. Now, with an EDSL approach, right, you can have your cake and eat it too. And what I mean by that is that your host language is, of course, a, a general purpose programming language. So we've got all of Haskell to manipulate these, this DSL. And, um, and so we've got the full power without um, having to worry about um, reasoning about this in, in our DSL uh, compiler itself. OK, lesson two, uh, multi-level type checking. So um, the idea here is that uh, uh, Haskell's type system, of course, is quite powerful. Um, it's quite nice. And so um, we want this to do as much work for us as possible. So for example, using things like GADTs um, are very nice for writing DSLs, and we, and we all know that. And there's only, um, really, in our experience, when we uh, wrote uh, Copilot, we had two places where we had to escape the type system, so to speak. So one is, of course, when we're actually printing files, te text files, C code, if that's unavoidable. Two, um, uh, for software engineering reasons, we uh, escaped, we did dynamic typing when uh, compiling from the uh, core language to the back end. The reason is we don't want to have all of these uh, uh, type class constraints um, mucking up the core representation that are coming from the back ends. And so for the truly paranoid, um, we followed actually the implementation of typing dynamic typing from 2002 so that we can do this without using um, uh, data not typable for those who are truly paranoid. So this, is, uh, this allows you to do dynamic typing using Haskell 98. So more generally, uh, we also uh, wrote this using say Haskell, so decorating modules and, and pack it with um, uh, using a subset of Haskell uh, to show what you trust and explicitly uh, ensuring that you're not leaving the type system by using say unsafe cores or, or, or other unsafe functions. Now, of course, for interesting DSLs, there's some, going to be some domain-specific type checking, and we do this, so we've got about five, or excuse me, about ten rules that we check. So just to give you a sense of them, we've got things like productiveness checks. So, of course, um, this definition is not productive, and we omit it during our type checking. We also check things like are the input values from the C world, which are just really strings as far as this con um, copilot is concerned, are they consistently used? Okay, lesson three. So um, with a small language and an unpowerful one, it makes things like testing and, and proofs simpler. So one thing, of course, you can do, an obvious idea, right, is quick check between the interpreter semantics and what you get when you compile. So, so we do this, and this helps alleviate the problem that I mentioned earlier about EDSLs encouraging you to make changes all the time. So using this for regression testing helps catch bugs. Um, and so, uh, you know, we would test maybe about, a, we could do about a million and a half programs a day just doing regression testing. Furthermore, you can go beyond this if you have a couple of backends, like we did, a couple of C backends, and uh, actually prove the correspondence between different backends. So again, remember, I've got very simple C programs coming out. And so we used uh, Daniel Klein's uh, CBMC about the model checker to uh, actually um, prove the client. So we'd, the uh, tool chain would automatically generate basically a uh, union C program that takes both, both the backend values, compares the state values, and, and then proves for any possible inputs that they correspond. So you need to have some bug that affected both backends in the same way to um, uh, pass this test. Okay, so 
The uh, final lesson, which is probably the most obvious to the folks in this room, but I think is actually one of the most powerful ideas, um, at least with respect to how things are done today in, in uh, much of the safety critical uh, programming world, is the idea of simply having a unified host language. So, of course, this alleviates a lot of potential bugs that I might have if I wrote a compiler from scratch. So things like front-end bugs, uh, type checker bugs, and so on and so forth. Also, um, you know, we've seen examples yesterday uh, about front-ends and languages for uh, using decision procedures, for example. And I can get all that for free, so I can use these libraries without ever escaping uh, the type system or having to worry about marshalling or demarshalling. I mean, someone else had to worry about that, but I don't have to. And then finally, um, actually, you know, uh, in, in a small way, kind of like um, what uh, Neil presented, um, we actually found that uh, we would actually use Haskell as a bit of a uh, build system ourselves. So for example, when we wanted to compile monitors on a distributed system, instead of having to worry about writing specific rules in, in a make file, oftentimes it was as easy as prioritizing the compile function and just, with the node identifiers and just uh, compiling uh, uh, the program for each node in a distributed system. Okay. So that's it. So um, in conclusion, I actually would like to talk about uh, prenatal care. Um, so this is a, a picture of a modern hospital, and these are baby incubators, and they cost um, upwards of $30,000. And this is what I think of when I think of um, uh, a verified compiler approach. So they're, they're expensive. Um, when you verify compiler requires uh, specific expertise, and there's you know very specific, just a few companies that make these. It's hard to make repairs. So if I change my language, I might have proofs that break, and I might have to make changes to those proofs, and it can be quite tedious. But things are perfect when they work out. So so for example, um, you know something like a verified C compiler is actually wonderful, and we could use this potentially as a backend because you know C is fairly stable. And so it's not going to change much. And once it's done, it can be reused. Um, this is an incubator that's been designed uh, for use particular, uh, mostly in rural Africa. And so it costs under $2,000 to make and mostly uses old automobile parts to run. So headlamps to heat, uh, dashboard fans to circulate air. And the idea is that you can always find it, some old car to make uh, anywhere in the world to make repairs. And this is what I think of when I think of uh, DIY assurance. So cheap, <laughs> quick to build, and it's easy to repair. So if I make changes in my language with things like quick check, things like model checking, uh, I probably not have. I probably don't have to go back and make fixes to those uh, to those aspects of, of the uh, tool chain. And although it's not a foolproof ass assurance, it's better than um, much of the assurance provided for typical compilers these days. And I, so I want to encourage people who are writing their own DSL to uh, think about including these kinds of uh, approaches for providing some assurance. So in conclusion, don't take my word for it, but do it yourself.